Hello, and welcome back to Early Global Cultures. I'm Professor Amy Young, and today we're going to discuss ancient Egypt. But first, as you probably guessed, I have a question. And my question is about the pyramids at Giza, or the most famous permanent structures from ancient Egyptian civilization. No doubt you've heard of them, and they've been romanticized by all sorts of global cultures for over 4,000 years. So if the pyramids were all that we knew about Egypt, if they were our only artifact, what would we know about this culture? How were they built? Who built them? What are they for? And what does this tell you about Egyptian culture? I'm guessing that you've heard that aliens built these monuments, but why do people think that? Could it be that later cultures weren't giving ancient Egyptians enough credit? These monuments are built with great artistry and precision, and we've been so spoiled with our centuries of technologically developed engineering and construction. We can't imagine anyone was able to do this without those advanced tools. But they were able to. And we really do ancient Egyptians a disservice when we credit these works to higher intelligences. You may have also heard that slaves built the pyramids, but where does that story come from? I'm guessing you heard it or read it as part of a biblical story, but those stories weren't written by the ancient Egyptians. So maybe we should take another look. Maybe we've misunderstood Egypt. Recently, archaeologists and Egyptologists have proposed that the pyramids were built by farmers in the off-season. They found evidence of workers' quarters around the pyramids. Plus, these structures were built to honor pharaohs, and pharaohs were beloved in ancient Egypt as they provided for Egyptians and ensured Egyptian prosperity. Oh, and we can also learn about Egyptian ideas of life and prosperity in the afterlife, too, when we look at these pyramids. For Egypt, unlike many other cultures, saw the afterlife as a continuation, not an end. And these pyramids were meant to ensure the pharaohs were comfortable even after death. And all of this brings up a really important point. We need to check our understanding every now and again. See, history is often written by the winners, and frequently those winners are mostly interested in making themselves look good. This results in them painting that which they don't understand as strange or wrong and reshaping the story so that they, the writers, look like heroes. For this reason, we should stop to consider our bias and stop to consider the source. And this was Egypt's fate. For thousands of years, the history of Egypt that survived was written by folks who were not Egyptian. It's only been fairly recently that scholars have started to reconsider Egypt's history without the noise of Greek or French or British interpretation. And some of that reconsideration has reshaped our understanding of ancient Egypt. So let's see what we can do to better understand Egypt today as we explore ancient Egyptian historical and philosophical context and evaluate Egyptian values via artistic expression and artifacts for ourselves. So first, a bit of context. Over 90% of Egypt is desert, but it's also home to the Nile, the longest river in the world. The lower delta is fertile and marshy. It has a milder temperature and more rain. And Upper Egypt is drier, and it's more favorable for monuments and temples. You may have also noticed a couple of curiosities with this map. First, most of the temples and monuments are on the west side of the river, and the reason for this will become clear when we get a little further into Egyptian religion. Second, you may have noticed that there are the labels Upper and Lower, and they're a bit counterintuitive map-wise, and this is because the Nile flows northward, toward the lower elevation at the Mediterranean Sea. And the Nile sets the tone for Kemet, or the Black Land. Kemet is the name Egypt calls itself as an homage to the rich black silt left behind after the Nile's annual flooding. The Nile is a blessing for Egypt. It creates a cyclical life with reliable rewards each year because the flooding comes like clockwork, and with it comes agricultural prosperity. How does this compare to the agricultural climate of Mesopotamia? 
And how do you think it might change Egypt's perspective on life and nature? What it does is it creates a unified culture with a strong belief in the, cycl in the cyclical nature of life and existence. And Egypt sought to maintain this balance and harmony with their brand of civilization. Egyptians were confident, assured of their place in the world and reverent of nature and their rulers as both were consistent providers. Egyptians identified as one people, one culture, even though they were racially mixed, they had common interests based on lifestyles and values. They pulled together and cooperated, unlike many of their neighbors who were impoverished and at war with one another. Egyptian history is divided into 31 dynasties. These begin with the old kingdom ruler Narmer conquering Lower Egypt and unifying the land, and this unification and stability lasts for nearly 3,000 years. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of what we know about Egypt is filtered through other cultures, mostly the Greeks, the French, and the British. In fact, Herodotus, a Greek known as the father of history, wrote about Egypt, and Greek scholars were sent to Egypt to study Egypt's intellectual advances. But it's not until much later that posterity is able to understand Egypt's own interpretation of their culture. And that has come to us via Egypt's written language, their art, and their monuments. Egypt's written language is called hieroglyphics, and hieroglyph is Greek for sacred carving. The language is a combination of pictograms, ideograms, and phonetic signs, and there are about 700 symbols in the writing system altogether. But in Egypt, writing is about more than just written communication. Writing is important for religious reasons, too. Priests must be able to write, and writing is thought to have supernatural powers. We know more about this writing because of the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. No, not the one that teaches you Spanish. Uh, the one that was created in 196 BCE and uncovered later by Napoleon's army in 1799. The stone had hieroglyphs and Greek writing side by side, and with this, translation of hieroglyphics was finally possible by non-ancient Egyptians. Can you believe that? No one knew what they were looking at until 1799. When Napoleon was conquered by the Brits, the Rosetta Stone went to England, and it remains there today, along with many other artifacts that were claimed and captured by those winning cultures. Nonetheless, Egypt, like Mesopotamia, bears those markers of civilization, including permanent structures, written language, and regulatory government. And in Egypt, that government is a theocracy. Theocracy is a government ruled by religion, where the god or gods and their representatives are in charge. And Egypt's government is a theocratic hierarchy. At the top, of course, are the Egyptian gods, and just below them is the pharaoh. The pharaoh is regarded as a living god and is often depicted as being a direct relation of one or more of the gods. In fact, it's not at all uncommon for the pharaoh to take a god's name as part of his or her own name. That's right, there were female pharaohs too. And the pharaoh ordered and controlled the visible world. So in a way, Egypt is held together by the pharaoh, and the well-being of the pharaoh equated to the well-being of Egypt. The pharaoh was trusted with absolute power. There was no division of government here. And he or she was the supreme judge. There was no written code. It was all up to the pharaoh, though rulings were sometimes based on precedent. The pharaoh protected Egypt from enemies and heard the citizens' pleas for justice. This figure offers security in life and also the people's connection to divinity. So really, as long as things were going well for Egypt, and they very often were, the pharaoh was trusted and beloved. Just under the pharaoh, there were the priests. Priests looked after temples and were responsible for the preservation of religious beliefs. Here, they make sure the gods are kept happy and the cycle of prosperity continues in Egypt. Part of these preservation duties included looking after the gods' wealth, and the priests collected offerings at the gods' temples. There was usually one high priest per god, and the priests were paid in offerings to the temple, so they had a vested interest in keeping those beliefs strong. 
here, like in Mesopotamia, ordinary Egyptians were not allowed inside the temples unless it was a festival or a celebration. But statues of the gods were brought out on festival days to visit the people. Oh, and that was another duty of the priests. See, statues were thought to be the physical manifestation of the gods, so they were washed and fed and given offerings so that the gods were kept happy. And since we're on the subject, it's probably a good time to look at philosophical context via Egypt's religion. In Egypt, deities are responsible for all aspects of existence. Most have animal and human characteristics, and often they emphasize the majesty of nature, mirroring life-giving and sustaining traits of the natural world. You don't have to remember them, but here are some examples of Egyptian gods. There's Amun-Ra, or Ra, which is the sun god, and he orders chaos. He's represented by the sun or by a figure with a sun disk behind its head. Anubis is the caretaker or god of the dead, and he is represented as a figure with a jackal's head. Jackals are a type of dog, and as scavengers, they're often found around and with dead things. Hathor and Sekhmet are important goddesses, and they represent love and protection. Hathor is usually shown with a cow's head or a cow's horns, and Sekhmet is a lioness or a female figure with a lion's head. Another important goddess is Ma'at. Ma'at represents truth, justice, and order, and she is seen as a female figure with a single feather headdress, or even just as a single feather by itself. Thoth is the god of wisdom that is also the all-powerful scribe or rep record keeper for Egypt. He is shown with an ibis head, and an ibis is a bird that dwells on the Nile. So you see, nature is emphasized here, and even though their gods have human characteristics, the human part of them is usually not their most recognizable feature. Other important gods tell us more about Egyptian values related to humanity and human interaction, and a few of them are Osiris, Isis, and Horus. The myth of Osiris tells us a lot about how Egyptians feel about death and the afterlife. And while there are a few versions of his story, he wasn't a super popular god until around the Egyptian Middle Kingdom. So the story goes that the earth god and the sky god have some kids, Osiris, Isis, Seth, and Nephithys. And as they are the first four people, they marry each other and set out examples for the rest of humanity to follow. Osiris marries Isis, and Seth marries Nephithys. And unfortunately, they do not all live happily ever after. From the start, Osiris is just and merciful. He is fearless, and he strives for harmony. And because of this, he's made the first pharaoh. Alongside him is his wife-slash-sister, Isis, who's a great protector and nurturer. Powerful in her own right, she also supports and empowers her husband. Seth, however, is not so amicable, and when his brother is made king, he becomes jealous and sets out to cause chaos and disorder. Can you see the makings of a classic good versus evil story here? Unable to tolerate the idea of Osiris as a great and mighty ruler, Seth sets out to kill his brother, but he knows his brother is smart, so he devises a master plan. Enlisting the help of some power-hungry co-conspirators, Seth plans to throw a party, and he announces that at the party, there'll be a game. In this game, the partiers must try to fit into a very special box, and the person who fits will win a prize. The box is, of course, built exactly to Osiris's measurements, and when Osiris tries it out and fits perfectly, Seth, boom, slams down the lid, seals the box, and throws it into the Nile. Another version has Seth cutting Osiris's captured body into pieces and distributing those pieces all over Egypt, but either way, Osiris is out of the picture, Seth is in charge, and Egypt is thrown into disarray under the cruel and selfish ruler. Meanwhile, distraught over her husband's death, Isis searches far and wide for his remains. She even turns into a bird to survey the land from the desert to the delta. 
She asks everyone, even evil spirits, for help finding him. And then, with her sister Nephethys' help, she locates the body of her husband, or pieces of him, depending upon which version you're following. She weeps over her husband, and these tears are later associated with the flooding of the Nile. With the help of Thoth and Anubis, Osiris is mummified, preserved, and with the help of a spell, Isis is able to retrieve his essence and become pregnant. So yeah, she's just a teensy bit of a necrophiliac. Later, she hides away with her son Horus and protects him while he comes of age. When he's old enough, Horus challenges Seth for the throne. They're both very powerful, and in the battle, Horus loses an eye. In the end, Horus wins, and Seth is castrated before he's cast out of the fertile lands of Egypt. Hathor restores Horus's eye, but she cannot restore his father's life. Osiris can't return to the land of the living, but since he was preserved by Anubis and Thoth, he is made ruler of the underworld, and there he is as benevolent and just as he was in life. So you see... This myth tells us a lot about what Egypt thinks it means to be a good ruler. It also tells us that evil exists, but it does not triumph when one looks to the gods and nature to restore and preserve life. Furthermore, this myth tells us that life does not end at death, and death is not something to be feared. Rather, life and death are merely part of a great cycle, one in which justice and loyalty prevail. In images, Osiris is often depicted with green or blue skin, like he is here, and this represents his fertility even in death. Just as the Nile seems to recede or die every year, it will return and bring abundance with it. He's also often depicted with his arms crossed in a mummy pose, representing his preservation and his readiness for the underworld. His wife, Isis, has interesting associations too. She is sometimes seen with a bird's wings, remembering her flight to find her husband. And in Egyptian lore, she is the ideal wife, mother, and protector. And Horus gets special symbolism as well. He is seen as the guardian of his father's legacy, and he protects the pharaoh on earth. He is depicted as a falcon, an animal with keen sight and instincts. And the eye of Horus is a powerful symbol of protection and restoration too. But this myth isn't the only narrative that shares Egyptian values and beliefs. We can learn more about what's important to ancient Egyptians by looking at the books of Duat. Duat is the name of the Egyptian underworld, the place where the sun god Ra traveled every night. And the books of Duat are made up of several texts, including the Book of Gates, the Book of Caverns, the Coffin Texts, the Am Duat, and the Book of the Dead. These books outline the journey to the underworld, the battle against chaos to bring back life, the weighing of the heart and the nature of the land of Osiris. Interestingly, the title, The Book of the Dead, is likely a mistranslation of the Egyptian, and the book is more likely called something like The Book of Going Forth by Day. That certainly has a different ring to it, and it better represents how Egyptians feel about death. The books are a collection of spells and instructions to get one through the underworld. Their verses are often written on tomb walls. In the early days, only royalty were privy to these sort of cheat codes for navigating the afterlife, but later everyone is welcome to the instructions. According to the book, when he or she dies, the pharaoh travels west to the underworld. Remember how all of those temples and tombs were on the west side of the Nile? Along the way... The pharaoh must pass through 12 gates, and while getting to these gates, the traveler faces all kinds of challenges. There are demons and lakes of fire, and all along the way, there's this giant snake who wants to devour the traveler and throw the world into chaos. This snake is Apophis. But after passing through all of the gates, the traveler faces their true test. Then their heart the seat of intelligence, emotion, and memory, is laid on a scale. The traveler's heart is weighed against Ma'at, remember the feather that represents truth. And they hope that their heart is pure and the scales balance, and then they can move on to the land of Osiris. 
As you can see here, the scales are held by Anubis and the judgment recorded by Thoth. If the scales balance, the pharaoh moves on to be reunited with the Ba and the Ka. The Ba and the Ka are the two parts of the Egyptian soul. The Ba is the part of you that makes you you, like your personality. And the Ka is your enduring life force, which is sort of closer to what we think of as the soul today. Both of these parts are waiting for you when you die, kind of like folks waiting to pick you up at the airport. So any guesses what the Egyptian dead move on to? Were you thinking pearly gates and bands of angels? Well, you'd be wrong. The land of Osiris is the mirror image of the life you had on Earth. If you're a king, that's great, but if you're not, maybe it's not as exciting as you hoped. But hey, at least you get to go on living, and Egyptian life is pretty good. This is why so many of the pharaoh's things are buried along with them. In fact, in the old kingdom, pharaoh's servants were buried along with them so that their afterlives would be just as comfortable as their regular lives were. Later, this practice was abolished, and small figures called shoptis were left in place of the servants. But since shoptis were only good for one use per day, pharaohs were buried with hundreds of them. This is probably why we see so many shoptis in museums today. Egyptian tombs were full of them. So that's one possible ending, if the scales balance. But what do you think happens if your heart is heavy with sin, if it doesn't balance with that feather of truth? What happens then is you're eaten by a mutt, devourer of the dead. A mutt is part hippo, part crocodile, and part lion, all fearsome beasts that threaten life on the Nile. She's pretty scary, but I kind of like her. There she is on the left. So there you are, devoured by a mutt. Then what? Fire and torture, darkness and sorrow. What do you think? Nope. After a mutt, there's nothing. It's just the end. And the end of the cycle is the worst thing that could possibly happen to you in ancient Egypt. So now is probably as good a time as any to talk about mummification. The mummification that we hear about the most is really the deluxe model. And it's mostly reserved for really powerful people. Other people were mummified too, but their processes were less careful and they sped things up so bodies were not as well preserved. But mummification, the deluxe model, took place in a tent of purification and the deluxe process took 70 days. To begin, the splitter, an important religious figure, cuts flesh with stone and then he puts his hands into the body and pulls out the organs, setting aside important ones in canopic jars so that they can be later left in a tomb in case the deceased needs them in the afterlife. Plus, getting rid of those soft organs and moisture helps the body dehydrate. Interestingly, the brain was not considered an important organ. It was pulled out through the nose with a hook and discarded, or it was even sometimes scrambled up inside the skull and poured out through the nose to remove moisture. The heart, however, is left intact. The deceased will need that for his or her afterlife trials. After organs and moisture are removed, the body is filled with spices, natrium, and salt and left to dehydrate. Once dehydrated, it's wrapped in linen, and priests put amulets in the strips of linen and write prayers on the linens to protect the traveler on his or her journey. The body is placed in a sarcophagus for additional protection, and all of this is placed in a tomb with everything the person might need or want in the afterlife. And as we saw earlier, those tombs were a pretty big deal, too. Pyramids are an artifact of Egypt's old kingdom, a time when there was great confidence and prosperity in Kemet. The first Egyptian pyramid was the Step Pyramid of Djoser, and it was created by Imhotep. We might consider Imhotep the first celebrity architect because he was later deified for his creation. Basically, he took the existing use of mastabas, or flat rectangular slabs for grave sites, and he stacked those mastabas on top of one another. And this eventually led to the design of the famous pyramids at Giza. The pyramids at Giza were created for the kings Khufu, Khafre, and Menkere. 
I'm using their Egyptian names, but I've included their Greek names here too, since that's what they were called for many years. These pyramids were basically man-made mountains and they were difficult and costly to create. The largest of them is made of over 2 million stone blocks. And at one time they were covered in limestone and rumor has it they were also topped by a gold capstone. The core stone was found on location and the limestone on the outside was from across the Nile. Travelers from afar would see perfect white geometric constructions rising up from the red desert, shining gold at their pinnacle. So yeah, they were pretty impressive and they showed off just what Egypt was capable of. The sides are perfect triangles and the points of the pyramid line up with the points of the compass. Egyptians were great astronomers and they used the stars and the sun to measure out important details. These are not just monuments to Egyptian greatness, though. They're also resurrection machines. The center chambers contained the mummified body of the pharaoh and his treasures, along with a false door so that the pharaoh might exit into the afterlife. The door might be decorated with images honoring the king and his family, and it would likely also provide instructions on how to navigate the underworld. In addition to the supplies left within the tomb, there was a vast complex surrounding the pyramids. And here were the tombs of their queens, as well as temples and pits for additional supplies the pharaoh might need on his journey. For instance, you may notice this slide shows you where there were boat pits for that journey. But the pyramids aren't the only Egyptian artifacts worth examining. Much of Egypt's art and architecture served religious and political purposes. Arts included wall paintings, statues, monuments, and sculptures. Here, as in other cultures, minerals were used to make color for paintings, but in Egypt, those colors were usually brilliant and long-lasting. Teams of artists worked on large wall paintings, and they were afforded a higher status in society even, ranked alongside religious scribes. Egypt had quarries, and they harvested exotic stone for statues and monuments. And I mentioned that often these sculptures were seen as the material manifestations of the divine. And gold and precious stones were also used for sculpture and jewelry, noting the importance of the person or the deity for whom the work was made. Generally, though, there was a standardized look in Egyptian arts, each piece using a similar stance, showing off characteristics and accessories that had symbolic meaning. And very often this meaning was for propaganda for the pharaohs or the gods. You notice that here too, we'll see that hieratic scale. So larger figures or figures higher up on the registers are more important. In fact, there are only a few distinctions throughout Egypt's long history and the old, middle, and new kingdoms have slight differences that reflect small shifts in Egyptian culture at the time. We'll begin with the old kingdom, and as I mentioned, this was a time of confidence and prosperity. The figures here are idealized, showing off what Egypt thinks perfection looks like. So take a look at this old kingdom couple. How do their facial expressions look to you? Are they stressed? Also, considering what we know of hieratic scale, what do you think of their relationship? They look pretty equal, right? In fact, in ancient Egypt, women could own land and operate businesses. They had a voice in law and trade. They were respected as mistresses of their homes. And like I said before, there were even female pharaohs. Women who commit adultery can still be burned alive, but all in all, women in Egypt were afforded some status. In this couple, we see a calm confidence. We see their ideal form and we see their power and strength. He's boldly stepping forward, a posture that is quite popular in Egyptian standing figures. And she supports and protects him, not unlike the ideal queen behaviors we heard about with the first queen, Isis. Other notable symbols here are the Nimes headdress and the false beard. The Nimes is the striped headcloth worn by pharaohs in ancient Egypt, and the false beard is also a royal trademark. Even female pharaohs were given them in artistic depictions. These were all pretty standard features, and things only changed slightly in the Middle Kingdom. 
In the Middle Kingdom, there was a little trouble with the rise of neighboring civilizations. A succession of weak rulers in Egypt makes outsiders think that they should take a shot at undermining Egypt's unity, probably in an attempt to scoop up some of her resources, and some of the art of this period reflects that unrest. Also in this period, the cult of Osiris becomes very popular, and average people adopt mummification rituals, hoping that the journey of the sun will be their way to get to the afterlife too. So statues and arts glorify the mythical king Osiris and ideas of mummification and resurrection. In this image, we see three statues of one king, Senwerset III. Do you notice any of those standard features we saw in the Old Kingdom? There's the Neem's headdress, yes. And he's got that same stiff posture, right? He also once had a false beard, but these statues have suffered some damage over time and the beards have broken off. With Senwerset, we can also see some of the stress of the Middle Kingdom's unrest, too. In nearly every statue of this guy, he has that same scowl, that so not-so-happy look on his face. Also, and I'm not sure why this is a thing, but statues from the Middle Kingdom often have big feet and big ears. Senwerset has big ears here. But hey... There was a time when mullets were in fashion for us, so we can't really blame these guys for what they think is sexy, right? In this next image, we see evidence of that cult of Osiris. Notice how the figure once again has that stiff posture. And once again, we see the false beard or evidence that there once was a false beard. But this time the guy's arms are crossed in a mummy pose, indicating he's also fit for the land of the dead. The next really big shift comes in the New Kingdom, and here, arts take pharaoh propaganda to the next level. This is the era wherein they build massive mortuary temples, honoring pharaohs and gods side by side, and in some cases, the rules for portion and tradition are cast aside completely to better represent the pharaoh's wish for his or her own legacy. One such pharaoh was Amenhotep IV. And in addition to moving the Egyptian capital to Amarna, he shook up Egyptian arts and even Egyptian religion. You see, Amenhotep IV was fed up with temple priests. He didn't like the power they were accumulating, and he wanted to simplify Egyptian religion too. In order to do this, he made one god, Aten Ra, the supreme deity of all of Egypt. He even changed his name to Ankhenaten, which meant the living image of Aten, to reinforce this new ethos. He also changed the way art looked, breaking with the past in visual representation, too. Here we see an image depicting him, his wife Nefertiti, and their three children. How does this work look different? How are they different than other Egyptian arts we've seen so far? They're not stiff, are they? And do they look ideal to you? And what are they doing? Can you tell? They're just chilling. They're playing with their kids. Hardly a powerful image. No, instead, this is a very naturalistic image. When something is naturalistic, that just means that the figures are behaving in a natural way. Is there anything in this work that points to it being especially Egyptian? Did you see the hieroglyphics? Maybe even the importance of the sun, in this case, the image of Aten Ra. But other than that, this work is certainly a departure from Egyptian style. And while his art preferences might be more dynamic, Ankhenaten's religious reforms were not so popular. After he dies, his son, Tutankhaten is adopted and cared for by priests, and those priests convince the son to revert back to the old ways, and the son even changes his name to Tutankhamun. You might know him as King Tut. So what do you know about this guy? Any idea why he's so famous? He was not the greatest pharaoh. He was not the youngest pharaoh. He wasn't even the most interesting pharaoh. I mean, he died at 19, so he barely had time to get anything done. No, King Tut is famous for his tomb, because it was the first tomb to be found with all of its treasures intact. 
Howard Carter found it in 1922. And then it was buried under the huts of folks who were workmen for a later pharaoh. So does that tell you anything about how Egypt felt about this guy, Tut? In fact, his tomb may have only been intact because no one really cared about it. The items inside of it were kind of tossed in like someone was loading up a storage unit. Maybe not the best example of how Egypt treated their beloved rulers, but an example that confirmed their burial rituals nonetheless. Here we can see part of that ritual in the death mask of Tutankhamun. You probably recognize the Neem's headdress and false beard again. And here we also see how important artifacts were adorned with gold and semi-precious stones. Do you remember the importance of blue? It's symbolic of new life or rebirth. And the gold is an homage not just to Egypt's prosperity, but also to the sun. So despite his flaws, Tut's mask is a fine Egyptian artifact. And there is one last New Kingdom artifact that we need to look at. That is the Temple of Ramses II. Ramses came to the throne at age 15, and he was said to be over six feet tall with red hair. But that's not the only reason he was special. He fought wars with honorary neighbors, and he won. He created long-lasting treaties, and he put his name on existing monuments. He even created new entrances to temples with statues of him at the door. He also had a long, long life. Even some of his children died around him because he lived into his 90s. Indeed, he was a beloved king, and he was also a master of propaganda. Take a look at his temple. There are hieroglyphs, which mark this as a distinctly Egyptian work, but do you see all of those massive figures, each with a Neem's headdress and a full beard? Those are all Ramses. All of them. Notice how much smaller the figures of his family members are? What does that tell you in terms of hieratic scale? Even above the entrance, you see that figure there. That's Ma'at. Even this divine figure is smaller than the pharaoh. Sadly, Ramsey's golden age does not last forever. Foreign invaders arrive on the sea. They first defeat the Hittites and then they head to Egypt. The economy falters and kings can no longer keep up with the Ramses II lifestyle. Even tombs are raided for riches as people of Egypt abandon their traditions in an effort to survive the changing landscape. Priests of Karnak rescue mummies in the Valley of the Kings and move them to secret locations. And all of those millennia of balance and prosperity based on tradition, cycles, and reverence for nature and religion, they come to an end. Knowledge of Egypt is preserved by Greek scholars who come to Egypt to study astronomy and engineering, and many Egyptian ideas and innovation come home with them. We can see the sarcophagus of one of their Greek admirers here, a cartographer on the right. The Nubians to the south also preserve some of Egypt's culture, but eventually Persians, Greeks, Romans, and Arabs move in, and Egypt is not an independent republic again until the 1950s. And that, my friends, is just a little bit about ancient Egypt. Hopefully you'll recognize their influence and maybe give them credit for their creativity when we see traces of them in upcoming cultures. Until next time.